Hey, what's going on, everybody? And welcome to Legacy's Journey, where we talk about creating what outlives you. I'm your host, Cameron Williams, owner of Kinley Consulting, where we focus on strategic financial growth for marketing agencies so that they can live the dream life they deserve and not be a slave to their business. And we do that through accounting, tax strategy, and CFO service. Now, y'all, it's season two. I told you, I had to go out here and get some big dogs. I had to put my feelers out. I had to tap into my network. Tell me, like, who's doing this at a high level? Like, who can I bring on here that can give the audience some value and just encourage them along their journey with their story? And I don't even know how this ended up working. I don't even remember how we met because, like, we met before we met. But anyway, this guy has been doing it for a while. He's speaking all over the place. He mentors typically at least 50 agencies, if not more, because, you know, he stay connected to them. I know he has an excellent team of different specialists. So we had to do it. We had to get Mr. P.O.D. in the building himself. Alex Shalinski is here. Cameron, thank you for having me, bro. We actually met at the High Level event. Uh, that's uh, how we yeah. met two years ago. I couldn't remember because I was like, did we meet there or did we meet before that? And then at the high level event, we just actually saw each other. in person. Yeah, we had a mutual client that connected us and then we met in person at the event. Basketball. OK, yeah. So, yeah, last year when I went to the Go High Level event. So this is fall of 23, I think it was. Yeah, right. we met and somehow we just made it work. So. It's not about me. Let's talk about you. Tell the people, name, name of the company, how long you've been doing it and who you help. Yeah, my name is Alex Shlinsky. I run Prospecting On Demand, uh, also known as Sky Social Media, which was originally the agency name. And then I did a DBA for the coaching and mentorship program and community we built called Prospecting On Demand. Uh, started the agency in 2010 when I was a freshman in college with my wife. Uh, did that as a side hustle business for about five years. Um, finished college, uh, and then kind of worked on the agency for 12 to 18 months with a coach, uh, expanded that greatly, handed most of it off. And then about a year after that, um, roughly 2016 time, I started taking on one-on-one clients, um, got my own coach to help me build a coaching program. Um, and then 2017 to 2018, uh, started building out what POD is as it is today. Um, and we've uh, scaled and grown quite significantly since then. Really proud to still be in this space and supporting so many agencies uh, all these years later. It's, it's crazy how fast time goes um, and that it's already 2024. But uh, yeah, that's the that's the brief version of it. All right. That's the brief version. But you got to tell them because you you like, oh, I just coach a couple of people and it's grown. Like we got backtrack. You got to tell them the story of how like you went from I'm doing this at a high level with. Uh, the law firms into like, how do you get into, because, okay, I'm coaching one person. That's one thing, but you're not coaching one person because I I know how many people you coach. You got to tell them, how was that transition? Like, what was that like to, even from the mental perspective to go from, I just have to worry about me and us performing at a high level to now tying in my success with some of these other people that we coach. Yeah, I mean, to be very uh, transparent, you know, working with the attorneys um, was a challenge for me as a human being. I I come from like community, uh, like a religious background that was like very soaked into community and like being part of a family that's big on community and inviting people into your home and having events and um, working in the legal industry uh, and doing marketing for attorneys did not really lend to that. Um, there, that industry is very much like, what have you done for me lately? Uh, and then what's next? So you get a great case and it's like, there's no celebration. There's no popping bottles. There's no appreciation. Um, I'm being hyperbolic here, but in a general sense, not much. It's just like, okay, get to the next one right away. I mean, I'm not really like that kind of like churn, uh, type of, uh, model. I'm not really like that, uh, hustle mode type person. Uh, so I had to switch over into working with entrepreneurs cause I had built a really successful agency. Um, and I was doing a one-to-one for a while. Um, But the max capacity of doing that was maybe like five people. And it was completely exhausting and draining, like pouring yourself into someone for hour to 90 minutes and doing that three or even four times a day. And then expecting that you can come home, um, you know, to your wife and to yourself and have anything left is just outrageous. Um, The coach that I worked with, his name was Austin, um, really great coach, helped me understand how to develop a group coaching program because I was worried for a long time about handing any of the service off because of one ego, um, but also to like the desired result I wanted was outside of my control. And that was something I was good at handing off uh, in the attorney industry, but not great um, in the coaching product. So 
it took a while um, to build that confidence to allow a team to to actually step in. Now we have 12 coaches in prospecting on demand servicing 50 agencies at a time. Um, but that turnover was really, really hard. Uh, and still today, I would admit comfortably that I'm in many ways the, the bottleneck of you know, POD, um, what I've done is set up my team in order to ensure that I can't be the bottleneck, meaning the mission um, and the goal of the company to support our clients uh, is significantly greater than just me as an individual. And so they hold me accountable to also making sure, no, Alex, you're not going to do that call or no, you're not going to take that step or make that training. So-and-so is going to do it or so-and-so is going to do it. And that's been um, a very interesting uh, change over the last particularly two and a half, three years since I had open heart surgery and had a child, um, which I know is just like a fun little nugget to throw in there. <laughs> but in general, that's uh, that was kind of the trajectory of the business. Okay, now you said a lot of stuff right there. Shout out to the to the child. Shout out to y'all will have to hear his his story. I'm, he can tell that, but we're not going to hit y'all with the tear jerkers right now. <laughs> I mean, unless you bring it up on his own. Because I heard the story, and my wife was like, damn, that was so deep. And I was like, yeah, that was real. But anyway, okay, let's go back to what you said. So now you said you have 12 different coaches. Yeah. And just to give you all a little insight, so what I know about POD um, is he has coaches in every area. So one of the things that I was kind of – I'm not going to say kind of, I was amazed with where I was like, okay, he has so many different people helping in different areas. So kind of go into more of the mindset of like, Hey, I got this person for sales. I got this person for ads. I got this person for mindset. I got this person for tech. Like how, A, did you find all these different people? B, I think you told me that like these people still all run their own companies yeah. And then see, you just kind of hinted at like me being OK with like letting them do their thing without stepping into their arena of genius. Like walk us yeah. through those, because I think a lot of people, they, they can get to that 300, 400, maybe 500 range. But then they start struggling because I'm going to do this and I want to keep that. Yeah. And I can't trust anybody to do yeah. it as well. So speaking to that force. Yeah. So I think, first of all, it's like having clarity of what I want in the first place, right? I think um, money motivation is probably the most common uh, motivation for any entrepreneur, but most people don't actually identify like what is enough, like what is enough money? There's a lot of people who make a ton of money, but are really dissatisfied with the amount of work they put in, the fulfillment or lack thereof that they get, the stress and anxiety as a byproduct of that, um, the lack of time they're spending with their families, uh, a lot of people struggle with this greatly. I actually wrote a book about it called The Anti-Hustler's Handbook, which you can go to antihustlehandbook.com and grab a copy. Um, the, the concept of this model for me was really defining what I really wanted. And so the first step was understanding I really wanted a community. I really wanted to have fun. I really wanted to make things not just business, but also personal. I wanted to help impact entrepreneurs to utilize their best asset, which is agency. And, and I don't mean like marketing agency. I mean like agency as the ability to choose what you want, to form and build the life you want because you don't have a boss telling you what to do. The biggest wake up call for most entrepreneurs is when they're dissatisfied with something uh, in their life or in their business, there's no one to blame, right? Um, there's no one to blame because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are creating this entire framework for themselves. And so when I find myself or found myself frustrated with the attorney model, I was able to change. When I found myself exhausted from doing one-to-one -one coaching, I was able to change. When I found myself that I wasn't making enough money because I was doing one-to-one, -one, I was able to change. And so that was the first step, understanding financially what did I need and what did I want, both for immediate security and ensuring that I was setting up myself for the future. And then also also for existential, uh, existential things that I wanted or additional, excuse me, things that I wanted for my life that might have been material or didn't actually matter. Once I had those things kind of locked in, I was comfortable staying at that rate based off of being in the place that I wanted to be in. Not like, oh, I'm not going to grow or, oh, I'm not going to challenge myself. All those things are still really important to me. It's just I felt comfortable understanding what was enough in a concept for me, which I think is very hard for most entrepreneurs. So I think that was the first step. The second step in terms of like allowing other people um, to coach and how did we make that happen and how did we hire them? How do they do it with their own job? Um, it, it really just comes down to like the mantra that I have about my business in and of itself. First of all, prospecting on demand 
in and of itself is a non-scalable company because we are chose to be boutique, right? We choose to be boutique by working with no more than 50 agencies. So we can pour into those people, make a real difference for them, help them and their team in a way that no one else can provide simply due to the amount of other people they have in the program. We don't churn through clients as a client acquisition company. We focus on retention as a client success company. And more than half of our client roster has worked with us for over two years, which is very rare in the coaching space. The coaching space and my competitors often have products that are like three, six, nine, or 12 months, and their retention rate is very low. We have more than a 50% retention rate, meaning people that finish the six month period, they agree to another six months. And very often they are at payment 24 or payment 36 and beyond, which of course we're extremely grateful for. And we've identified by doing that, by instead of going in, in each inch deep and mile wide, we go an inch wide and a mile deep. And that model to us has been significantly more valuable and profitable, not just financially, but also emotionally um, and personally. As you know, Cameron, you and your wife came to my house for an event. Like we invited you into our home where our child lives, where we, you know, do our business, but we did it because that is important to us. And it's a core value of ours to invite people into our home and to create a sense of community and to have a good time. And you actually took the stage for a minute and did a great job uh, sharing your expertise. And I thought that was awesome. The way that we built this was so that we can actually really pour into people. And the reality of hiring other coaches was just based off of, I cannot do this all by myself. I'm not skilled at everything. Um, I don't have the time to do everything. Uh, and I want to make sure that you know I could prop up other amazing people that are great coaches are great at what they do um, and support them. So the last part of that question was like, how do they do that when they have another job? We have five employees at POD, um, myself, uh, my wife, who's my co-founder and our productivity coach, Shira, um, Jennifer uh, Wright, who's our operations director and accountability coach, Jody, who is our accountability coach, and Brian, my business partner and head coach and head of marketing at Prospecting On Demand. Everyone else on our team are contractors, 1099s. Um, the reason being is they all have their own jobs um, because what we get to do is leverage them as boots on the ground support. So the person that's helping you with scaling in your agency currently runs an $100,000 a month agency with very good profit margins where she has to work you know, less than 10 hours a week or so. Uh, in that same vein, it's the same concept as the person who's you know, helping with your Google ads. They run a Google agency that does to over $2 million a month in Google ad spend. So that model has helped us ensure that we have the most up-to-date cutting edge information as best we can um, while very, having very limited uh, churn. We have certainly churned um, coaches in the past, of course, just based off of their scalability and their goals, um, but all in good faith, all in good standing. Um, because at the end of the day, the mission of the company and community is stronger than any individual person, including myself. Mm, okay, there was a lot there. There was a lot. Let's go back. You talked about buying. And I think that's super important because how do you get all of these different people at different stages of their agency journey? Um, like you just mentioned, all right, we got somebody who's running a $100,000 a month agency. How do you get not only the coaches to buy in to say like, yeah, this is worth my time. I'm with, I'm all for it. Like, let's do it. Whatever you need on there, as well as then flipping it to the client and getting okay. them to say like, this is different from other uh, masterminds that I'm in or other types of groups and that, because I've seen plenty. I've been in plenty. I am here to admit POD is very different than the normal uh, what meet once a week or every other week on Zoom type. So they are doing things different. So like speaking of that and how do you create that buy-in for your team and for clients? So for the team, it comes down to a mantra that we have. It's an acronym that we created called the CHAMP model, which is being caring, helpful, available, motivating, and proactive. Uh, every person on the team has to follow through with these five tenets of our product because we believe in each of these uh, models so significantly that creates an environment of buy-in and everyone has the same mission and goal, which is truly helping people. When you help anyone in life or in business, whatever the result of that help is, uh, whether it's financial, emotional, uh, physical, material, all of them together, uh, or some amount, whether it's you've helped them 20% or 100%, uh, 
Uh, the feeling of fulfillment based off of gratitude from someone else is no question the best way to fill your cup, right? Helping someone genu genuinely is great, regardless of whether or not there's a financial incentive to do so, um, as long as you did it with the appropriate intention. And so our intentions are always set with the champ model. I think that is really how we get our team to be on the same page, um, to support uh, appropriately and make sure that our, you know, our goals are always aligned. And that includes accountability from everyone on the coaching staff, including me. I'm big on the Knights of the Roundtable approach. I try not to say that I'm better than anyone else or that I'm sanctimonious. Sometimes I certainly am doing that. Sometimes I am too egotistical simply because I'm a human being. But in a general sense, I'm always working towards having the appropriate intention of, you know, this is a circle. Everyone's opinion matters, uh, et cetera. Uh, even with maybe it seems like, uh, you know, it's a fake reality because at the end of the day, Alex gets final say, which I understand. But in general, I try to c cultivate that environment where everyone's opinion matters. Uh, every feedback matters. All accountability um, matters. And I'm not beyond reproach. So that's for my team. On the client side, it's very different um, and very important to understand, like, how we operate in our sales process. So first of all, we don't have any salespeople um, in the company because of the size of the company and how we operate. I do sales and Brian does sales. That's it. Those are the only two people uh, to make sure that anyone that's coming into our community fits our energy, uh, fits our community vibe, has the right intentions appropriately, uh, is not an asshole, is a big one, um, and ultimately uh, is really interested in getting supported. Um, not expecting some done for you model. There's a lot of stuff out there like promising done for you models and just like the math doesn't make any sense. There's no way you're going to pay someone $10,000 and they're going to give you a business that's recurring $20,000 in revenue. There's no math that makes sense on that. And yet some people still buy that. I don't get it. The model that we do is, is essentially what I call the real investment close. It's the concept of if you go into a gym, Okay, and you pay the gym for a year of membership up front. Say it's two hundred dollars a month, so it's twenty four hundred dollars a year. Okay, you go there, you pay them, and you're like, okay, I'm ready. Give me abs. Do it. I paid. Nothing's gonna happen, right? You're not gonna get abs, right? The work has to be done. You have to put in the work consistently every single day. And so we focus less on the investment of prospecting on demand, right? It's a three thousand dollar a month investment. We have nothing to hide from that. The value that we provide is insurmountable. It's the best in the space. Uh, and ultimately, our proof, you know, speaks for itself. But in a general sense, the financial investment for companies doing 20 or $25,000, which is really our bread and butter recurring, that's an easy investment. The real investment is the time, our most valuable asset we have, investing that time, investing that energy, investing the opportunity of that time, right, because you could be spending it elsewhere and your team to ensure that you're going to get the results by doing the things that we ask you to do, communicating with us on a day-by-day -day basis, holding accountable to the things we promise because it's a symbiotic relationship. And so if people are not willing to do that work uh, on the front end, meaning, oh, I'll pay you, but I won't do the work, we won't accept the money. Now, of course, once people actually get into the program, right, it's natural to be overwhelmed very easily. Like, how do I get into a new mentorship program? How do I not get overwhelmed? It's totally understandable. We try to take it in bite-sized chunks for every person because it's a custom game plan for every person based on where they're at. Some people need a salesperson right away. Other people need more calls right away. Other people need to, you know, fix their agency. That's a Frankenstein business with a bunch of different niches. So each person has to have nuanced approach and support. And we take it at their pace, trying to put a little bit of pressure on, but not like to the point of, like, oh, your backs against the wall model is just not how we operate. It creates a lot of stress and anxiety for no reason. We're not going to work with anyone for their last dollars. That's not our model. And so the way that we've cultivated it is being very transparent about what's required to succeed. And for those that do it, they get the results. And for those that don't, they don't get the results. It just comes down to what your willingness is to succeed. I always say this, and I believe this wholeheartedly, we just help winners win faster, right? I don't like taking credit for we made this person a winner. I think that's totally irresponsible, completely untrue. Um, we're the equipment at the gym. We're the dietitian that's telling you what to eat. We are the personal trainer telling you what to do, but we're not doing the diet. We're not running the miles. We are not, uh, you know, giving you, uh, you're not utilizing the equipment because you made it, right? It's, this is the work that you're putting in. If you put that work in and you care about this and want the result, it's going to happen for you. And I think that's how we've cultivated the environment of, you know, immense success. That y'all, there was a lot right there. Okay. To try to attempt to summarize that, 
We care about people deeply enough to hold them accountable and bring out what we know is already there. We're not going to sell you just to make a sale. Because he even told me that. He was like, I'm just telling you. If it's not going to work, I'm going to I was like, oh, all right. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Y'all need, just need to go back and just listen to that whole clip. Just, just do that. Now, another thing you said, you talked about your partner. And I think this is super important because a lot of people are like, well, how do I pick the right partner? How do I know we're aligned? You know, how do we stay in our own lanes and not step on each other's toes? And you speak very highly of Brian all the time. So kind of, you don't necessarily have to tell us how you met, but what made you say, I'm willing to split the money with this guy and build this with this person from the ground up? So for whatever your reason. Yeah, no, I'm I'm fully transparent. You know, I have nothing to hide, honestly. At the end of the day, like transparency, in my opinion, is the bridge to connection. Vulnerability is the bridge to connection. Like social media is so curated um, in today's day and age. Like everyone wants to have a very particular image. Um, and my image is just human being, which includes, you know, positive, negatives, flaws, emotions, like all of that. So I don't really have any issues um, with transparency. I'm, I'm just a big proponent of being as transparent as possible, but also as tactful as possible. I think that's kind of the, the line that I try to, uh, m- you know, model people have expressed before, like, um, honesty, um, is, uh, like honesty is a goodness, like essentially, but sometimes honesty can hurt people. So, uh, tactfulness, I think is a really important kind of frame as well. Um, in general, I met Brian in another mastermind we were part of called the entrepreneur Alliance. Um, that mastermind did monthly spotlight sessions, just like we do in prospecting on demand. Um, and so at one of the, it just so happened that I think we had back to back months where I did my one call close training This is way back is like 2017. Um, so it's like the beginning of my training career, um, did a training for it. There was probably like 250 people in the mastermind at that point, uh, got a lot of love for that, which was really cool. Cause I was still really early in kind of formulating my process and I'm like infinitely better than I was then. And so that was very uh, rewarding. One of those people that messaged me was Brian Downard. I'm um, talking about it and saying, you know, he runs a coaching program for, um, you know, helping people use LinkedIn to get clients. And, um, you know, he loved the training it helped him with sales and, uh, you know, he's doing the training next month, would love for me to jump on. So I jumped on, I loved his energy. I loved, you know, his transparency, the way he was communicating, it just felt very right. And so we had a conversation about, you know, I needed to bring on a coach based off of the coaching I was getting. And I didn't feel confident in knowing who that was, because I didn't know anyone that I knew personally in my community. And I never worked with anyone online, really outside of my clients. And so I asked him if he would be open to doing that. Because perhaps instead of us creating separate programs, like his was a LinkedIn thing, mine was an agency growth thing, Uh, mostly at that time was really focused on sales, but in a general sense, um, how can we work together and just felt natural, he could get people book calls, I could help them close deals. And it just felt like that was a no brainer. Um, And so we believed together that we could go farther, faster, um, and make more impact together than we could individually. And I think uh, it's paid off very handsomely, uh, financially and fulfillment wise for us, you know, we run I think like 16 or 17 events, um, something of that nature. I'm not exactly sure the exact number, but, you know, I remember when we were planning for our first big event in March of 2020, the concept was very daunting to us, but also very exciting. Uh, And then finishing that event um, and realizing like, wow, we just did that. Like we just had 150 people or 130 people out in Tampa and like we crushed it and we sold 25 memberships to our program, which was brand new at the time. And um, we did it again. And again, obviously COVID withheld us a little bit. We did some virtual ones, but we ended up doing, you know, like six, seven, eight uh, events since then, including a massive one. Uh, Last year, we did 150 people, which was our most ever. And I think, you know, sometimes we just look back, like, can you believe that this all started off with like, just a Facebook message of, you know, doing some coaching for LinkedIn. (laughs) And now here we are. It's pretty amazing. So that was the model um, that we came up with. And it's it's just been really beneficial uh, for both of us, our families and, and our clients as well. There you go. And, you know, I think it's it's awesome that you said that, because, I mean, since I became a business owner, I mean, I've met people all over the world just off one DM, one message or one post. So I think that was great. OK, tell us, stuff. So you told us how you met and why. Now, tell us in picking a partner 
because I'm sure y'all have been doing this together for over four or five years at this point. 2018. What are some of the things that you've noticed like, this is why I picked you as a partner? Because I think, again, some people struggle with that. Like, I don't know who to trust or what should I be looking for? What qualities or characteristics? Or yeah. I'm growing it. I'm willing to give up some equity, but I still need to pick the right person. So yeah. what would be your advice based on your experience and how to pick that perfect partner, number two, CEO, whatever? Yeah. I feel like it's probably a similar answer to like, you know, when's the right time to have a kid, right? I think anyone that has a, that's a parent, which I know obviously you are, I am, Brian is, I don't know how many listeners are, but um, maybe you have a kid, maybe you want to have a kid. Um, but if you're on either side of the fence, you'll get the exact concept, right? If you don't have a kid yet, you're waiting for the perfect time. If you have a kid, then you know the exact mantra and, you know, quote is there is no perfect time, right? So we spoke about my heart surgery for a second, you know, like during COVID, I had to wait 10 months um, because of the because of the pandemic uh, to have my surgery. And in between that time, uh, Shira, uh, my wife got pregnant, uh, kind of accidentally, it just it just happened, right? Um, and that was not like we hadn't planned that it just happened, right? And it's the best thing in the whole world. Like Ellie is three years old now. Um, he's the greatest thing in my whole life. There's nothing I could love more than him. Um, but in a general sense, right? It's like, I didn't plan that. And so I think, you know, you, you made a comment about like, who do I trust? Inherently, the way that I was raised is that we're all part of the same tribe, um, like the human being tribe. Um, and just having more grace for people in a general sense, like, cause you have no idea what someone is going through, what challenges they're dealing with. And the reality is everyone is dealing with some level of challenges. Some people manage it really well. Other people really struggle with it. And so to me, like, it's just so much easier to give grace. I don't know why it tends to feel like in at least social media, right. That the impact, um, is very consistently like negative steered towards like negative media, uh, negative thoughts or feelings, uh, like jealousy, uh, frustration about someone else's success. And of course, I've fallen yeah, into that too. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm not being sanctimonious. Of course, I felt those ways. But I just find it so much better. Like a mutual friend of ours, one of our clients, Brett, he talks about this concept of loving people when they least deserve it and least expect it. And I love that concept. I think the idea of just like uh, being more graceful, uh, providing more love to other people, even in the face of challenges is really great because I think more love would be better for everyone. So like, I'm a big words of affirmations person. I like complimenting people on what they're wearing or how they're doing or telling them I'm proud of them. I like doing that. I also like hearing that it's just something that really is impactful to me. So when it comes down to trust, like inherently, I just trust everyone. Is that, uh, naive? Of course. Have I been burned by that? Absolutely. But in comparison, when you do a T chart of, okay, Alex's trust as a whole in his life and business and career, like in terms of win journals versus, you know, things that happen negatively because of that, the wins so far outweigh the negative things. And I've been robbed before because I've trusted someone. So it's like, in general, you know, I'm a big just truster. Like I'm down to trust first and then learn from that. I think a lot of people are all, or do it the alternative way, which is completely fine. It's like, you have to earn my trust. You have to earn my respect, which I think is okay. It's totally okay. It's just how I was raised, how I like to portray like myself, um, how I like, you know, how I want my son to be. Um, and ultimately you just understanding like the nuance of where to protect yourself. So in business, I think the the two main mantras that I'd have is you're never going to know who's the right partner, who's the right person to work with. And you also don't have to just have a boilerplate conversation. Like it's 50, 50 automatically, or it's whatever, like you can do no equity. You can do profit sharing. You could do whatever you want, right? Like you have the agency and capability to do that. You can date for a little bit and then get married eventually. Like that's the concept, but I just prefer the, the model of understanding how decision-making works. And I think this is very valuable in a general sense, right? And this comes down to sales psychology, but in decision-making in a general sense, Decision making in general is very hard for pretty much 99% of people. It's significantly harder and creates more anchors when there are when there's more on the line, meaning there's time responsibility, like urgency, there's financial responsibility, meaning investment, and there's time investment that you have to put in, not just like a deadline, right? And when you have those additional anchors on top of that, some other anchors like emotional anchors, et cetera. It creates a very challenging decision-making process where we waffle, right? And that's why people do like decision-making trees of pros and cons and that kind of stuff. But it just becomes very hard to do it. In very small examples, it's like 
why do people like look at Netflix for 40 minutes before deciding what to watch? Even though there is no financial responsibility, there is no time commitment other than watching the show or movie, and there's no urgency on the deadline, why do we still have a hard time with that, right? Versus with a, another like concept would be where to go to eat. And then the last one would be what partner to have, what mentorship program to go be a part of, what investment do I make for sponsorship for an event, as an example, right? When you consider those and realize like decision making is hard in general, the way that I like to think about it is you can never make a wrong decision. Now, when I say that, I slow down for a second and I give that pause because people are like, what do you mean? Of course, yeah, I can I'm like, wait, what? what? So I'll give you an example. I'm a huge football fan, massive Miami Dolphins fan. And you might make a joke right now. Well, you made a wrong decision by being a Dolphins fan. And to that, I say, that's not nice. I love the Dolphins. Don't be mean. <laughs> Joking aside. <laughs> Joking aside, okay, though, okay. Um, there's a concept called Monday morning quarterback, right? In football. Mm -hmm. The concept is basically like reviewing game film from the quarterback and the quarterback threw an interception and the incredible analyst insight is you shouldn't have thrown that interception. And it's like, bravo, bravo. You get a job at ESPN. You're so smart. You're amazing. And I love this concept in life and in business because the reality is you can only make a bad decision upon reviewing the film, upon the outcome, upon the retrospective result, right? In hindsight, which is why people call it a hindsight is 2020. No one purposely sabotages themselves. And again, when I say no one and you say absolutes, like there's really no such thing as absolutes. Of course, some people do, like for whatever reason it is, it's not really the point of the show. In a general sense, the large majority of human beings don't make any decisions on purpose to sabotage themselves or on purpose to make the wrong decision. No one goes into a sponsorship idea and be like, okay, this is 20K. I'm going to make this 20K investment and I'm definitely not going to make my money back. No one does that obviously, right? But you go in with That's fear and you make a 20K investment, then the outcome comes out and you didn't make your money back. Well, that was a bad decision. No, it wasn't. That's a bad decision by retrospect in reviewing. That's the same concept of saying, you shouldn't have thrown that interception. Well, okay, maybe if you looked at the coverage and you see it was two high shell safeties and there's a middle linebacker in the, in the middle of the field, maybe if you change the coverage and call play for the next time, this is the same concept. So the idea for people is take the step, right? The only wrong decision is indecision because indecision guarantees that you can't get any outcome. We don't control the outcomes the majority of times when we make decisions, the majority of times, right? Sometimes we get the outcome, but most of the time it's just the action, meaning the decision to do this thing and then whatever outcome it is. When you get the outcome, you just review the outcome and whatever that outcome was, you use that to optimize for better decision making moving forward. And so, for example, if you make a decision to work with a potential partner, right, and you do a date and you do this thing, and it totally blows up in your face in three months, well, that doesn't mean you made a bad decision. It just means we have to identify what went wrong after a decision was made so you can make a better decision the next time. I love that my model of thinking. It helps me feel more comfortable with big decisions I'm making um, because most of the time the stakes are a lot lower than you think they are. Um, and it makes it just a lot easier uh, to feel comfortable moving forward. And so I try to be a really good decision maker. Am I a really good decision maker? Probably not, honestly, probably not. Um, I still struggle with indecision and um, but I think understanding the framework helps me be better at being a bad decision maker. <laughs> That's, I think, the best way I could say it. That's good because I had that situation happen to me. And I see it. I would have qualified it as a bad decision because, like you said, I had to pick some. Well, the person kind of sought me out and they had this great, oh, Cameron, you're young. I'm older. You're a guy. I'm a lady. You're black. I'm white. This should work perfectly. Like, we can get everybody. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. Sure. And like you said, I think I made sure to say, like, let's try this for six months because we never work together. Maybe it'll be great. Maybe it won't be. And then at the end of six months, we can decide how we want to do everything. Right. To your point, it didn't work out. But in hindsight, like you said, I was like, you know what? Was that the best decision Probably not because it didn't work out. But had it worked out, I would have been up there like, oh, yeah. man, I took a leap of faith and it worked. And all. Yeah. So that's a very good point. I, I think the interim decision concept is really valuable. Like I like think of it similar to like an appetizer in a buffet. It's like you don't have to get the main course with every decision you make. If you can get some appetizers. But in why first, do we do that, though? Because I feel like everybody thinks every single decision, especially once you become a business owner and you 
let's just say after you've hit six figures, so you making five figures a month, you feel like everything, like if I hire a person, that's important. If I don't go make sales this week, that's important. If I don't take a break and rest, that like everything is at a nine or a 10, when to your point, you're like, eh, that's probably like a four. You know, that's yeah, probably I two. think, um, you know, I, I resonate extremely strongly with the concept of everything feeling urgent and important in a nine out of 10. Um, I'll give you a quick example um, from one of my coaches, uh, Dr. Willie Madaway, who who works with us in POD. Um, he's incredible. I mean, he, re- he really is. Cameron, he does the calls on Mondays. If you haven't been on there, he's just the best. Um, so I've dealt with anxiety and stress uh, my whole life. Um, it got substantially worse um, uh, probably two years before my surgery based off of the business growing substantially. POD has grown essentially 20% year over year for the last like six years. Um, Then I had surgery and had a baby, which obviously inherently creates significantly more anxiety and stress. Um, COVID, of course. Um, And so I've been working really hard through uh, therapy, counseling, coaching to lower the stakes on things in a general sense. And based off of doing a lot of auditing of game film, as we were referencing, it really benefits a lot to realize certain situations, which you graded nine or 10 at that moment, then something happens six months later that you graded nine or 10, but you, re- you retrospectively recall that nine of 10 that you had before wasn't important. Like it was like a two in retrospect. So now you're redefining and recalculating for yourself in real time how it's going. And I'm getting better at it, like significantly better at it. I wrote a book for it, the Antisource Handbook, not just for people, but for me too, to remember these insights. But Willie Mattaway says something great to me. Um, in December, we had a we had a uh, probably like a twenty five percent drop of revenue in POD. We lost uh, some legacy clients that we had for a long time, and we lost um, some clients from an event that we ran uh, where we did a special offer. Um, everything was copacetic in terms of like their experience was solid and good. It was just like they had squeezed the juice out, and there wasn't really anything we could do. Uh, the concept that my team members were saying was like. Hey, if someone graduates, you know, uh, high school, no one's being upset that they didn't stay back for a year. But I felt like that was kind of like this model of like trying to do mental gymnastics for we could have saved them, we could have retained them. Um, And so I messaged William, I remember, and I said, this is the worst case scenario, like making it a 10 out of 10 process, right? His response back to me was extremely grounding and very beneficial. And I think it's really beneficial for anyone listening to this pod, because by all, all matters of people that follow me online that just like look at me or think of who I am, like I am um, stereotypically successful, like financially successful, uh, personally successful, got through heart surgery. I have a wife that I met in high school. I have a beautiful, healthy son. Um, You know, I have a home. I have a beautiful business. I have a great community. I have awesome team members. I have all my family. Both my parents are alive. All these things I am unbelievably grateful for. Um, But yet, uh, you know, many times you don't feel that way. Like the person themselves don't feel that way. And so I sent this to Willie Mattaway. I said, William, this is my, this is the worst case scenario. And he sent back that. I thought the worst case scenario was you passing away from heart surgery. I thought the worst case scenario was not meeting your son. I thought the worst case scenario was sheer being left a widow. And when he sent me that text, what he was doing was redefining and re-strategizing for me. What does actually matters to you, Alex? Because he had the same confidence that I knew I had. I just was emotionally withheld from having this confidence at that moment, which is the confidence I have, which now I have three months later, which is we'll make all that money back. We'll be fine. And we have. And we're fine. Right. Because, again, it was a 10 out of 10 there. Now it's a one out of 10, two out of 10. What he was doing was talking about the things that really actually matter to me. And the reality is, you know, bluntly. When you go into heart surgery, no matter how good your odds are, you think you're going to die. There's no other way to say it. That's the reality, Cameron. But I didn't. And I'm alive. And my surgery was three and a half years ago. And I have a beautiful son and a great wife and an amazing business. And who cares if you lose 25% of revenue in a month? Because you're going to make it back. And so it just helped me recognize to understand how to deal with problems that most of the time you think the problem is going to be this big. But then in retrospect, in hindsight, in reviewing the game film, as I call it, the problem is really this big. And very, very rarely are problems this big. 
usually those problems are the health and wellness of the people you care about most. And if you have not dealt with that yet, thank God, seriously, regardless of whether you're religious or not, like just thank whoever for that incredible gift, right? Because it is a gift. Because as soon as that happens, which hopefully it never does, but you know, the reality is we all die. So it's going to happen at some point, right? As soon as that happens, every other thing you realize is so much more minuscule than you made out to be. And that's why I try to walk every day with more grace for myself on understanding what really matters. Do I do it perfectly? Absolutely not. Uh, Am I saying it in a sanctimonious way on this podcast? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And this is me being, again, transparent and vulnerable. But I can say confidently, Cameron, man to man on this podcast, recorded or not, straight up, bro. I've made so much progress just in the last year, just in the last year, like significant amount of progress. Writing that book was hugely imposter syndrome for me, but just doing a lot of game film watching. I've just made a lot of progress on problems. And so when problems occur now, what used to be an eight out of 10 response, most of the time is like four or five out of 10. And that is a massive, massive win. Massive. So big. And for anyone out there listening to this, seriously, and I mean this, if you are struggling with it, please message me. I will happily help you. You don't have to pay me anything. I will just be an ear to lean on. But just remember the problems that you've had, you've had them probably before. And you thought at that point that those were the biggest deals and problems ever. And yet you were fine. And so if you can just have the confidence that you know you are a problem solver, a puzzle solution solver, that you can get through any obstacles because you've done it prior, right? It will really give you so much more confidence moving forward and make your life a lot better. And that's really what I want for everyone I work with and everyone I speak to. That was good. All right. We're coming close to the end of our time. Let's do rapid fire so we can try to get a bunch of good, solid answers. Absolutely. And this will probably produce some great clips. All right. Here you go. Tell us. Things you have learned in working with your spouse in the business. Wow. Things I have learned in working with the spouse in business. Communication is number one priority. Um, Drawing lines in the sand of communication timelines of when we're talking family versus business. It's really hard for me to uh, vacillate between both of those without having hard lines in the sand. Um, And three, uh, understanding boundaries, which is kind of all the same answer, um, but in a general sense, like, Uh, the communication boundaries and lines in the sand for when you're communicating about business versus personal life. You have worked with them. What is the difference between the agency who's making a hundred thousand or more per month versus the one who isn't? And let's just say for this example, they both been working five years, but client one, he's making like 30, 35 grand a month. Client two is making one hundred and five thousand a month. What is the main difference you've seen as the coach to the superstars that separates them from each other? Yeah, I'll, I'll just preface really quick that I think a lot of people in this type of environment or or model wants to be like, oh, the uh, like one of the people like had certain variable luck and the other one had certain variable like disluck or unluck or whatever you want to say. And I think it, it to some degrees that's like rel- relatively true. Like, you know, with my agency growing it, like I grew up in a Jewish community. And so from my temple, I ended up getting like 10 attorney clients right off the rip. And some people can't do that. And that made me think that building business was easy, but it's not really at all. So I think that's one. So like there are certain factors, of course, outside of control. Let's talk about within control. Like what's the differentiating factor, meaning everything that they outcome they got was from something they did. I would say it's really like two main specific things. Uh, Number one um, would be advertising. Um, Investing in advertising is just a really critical thing to get to a six figure a month rate um, because every other model of acquisition is just significantly harder to scale. Um, the majority of agencies doing six figures or plus per month are running significant number of, uh, of money on ads. And when I say significant, I mean like $10,000 or more per month. So that's a consideration. Uh, the second thing would be Dream 100, like franchises. Um, I did a podcast series last year where I interviewed seven agencies doing over a quarter million dollars a month. So significant, uh, you know, significant, significant size businesses. Um, every single one of them had a franchise uh, partnership where they were getting a uh, huge amount of clients from like a jujitsu company or a restaurant uh, franchise company or uh, insurance brokerage or whatever it may be. 
obviously at a discounted rate, but their cost per acquisition was so low, their margins were very lean, but ultimately it was a churn model, like a, a process model that was really easy to scale. Um, that's a big one. Just a third one, just to give an insight that I think is a big differentiating factor, um, those who sponsor events. Showing up in person at events, especially for hard to get niches like doctors, attorneys, et cetera, companies that do that consistently and make those investments of time and money have a huge advantage. So I'd say those three things. That's good. Top three things you need to be doing to make your first seven figure year. Well, okay. First seven figure year, top three things. Uh, stop saying yes to everything. I think the concept is like, can I compile enough money um, from all of the opportunities to to get enough? And, and I just don't think that like that's an effective rate uh, to do so, right? So if you consider... Um, you know, how to get to a million dollars. Basically, it's like $84,000 a month, right? So if you consider you, you, you need to be making roughly eighty three dollars to $84,000 a month, what's the easiest, most efficient way for you to do that um, based off of, you know, your network, based off of the people you know, based off of, you know, the market that you have some sort of opportunity with? To me, the, the easiest model is going to be having a product that's at least $2,000 a month. Um, if you have a product at least $2,000 a month, you're looking at roughly 40-ish clients to get to that number. Ideally, it's $2,500 a month because if you're there, you're looking at about 33 clients. Uh, a lot of people think that number of like 30 to 40 clients is very insurmountable. But the truth is, if you just bootstrapped it and went in person um, you know, to multiple uh, vendors in your area, you could probably end up getting 10 to 15 clients right off the rip um, in a three-month period pretty easily. Um, so I'd say... That's a big thing, like understanding the pricing of your product and where to go. Uh, number two, um, getting clarity of what you want to take home. Because a lot of people, you know, they'll get seven, they'll make seven figures, um, but then they won't make a lot of money. We had a client two years ago who came into POD and he said, we did a million dollars last year. Uh, and, and I was like, oh, that's amazing. Like, what was your profit? He made a million dollars. His company spent $920,000. So he made $80,000 on, on top of also having a $60,000 salary. So you know, he, he made a decent amount of money, but nowhere near what the number that we're suggesting is. So I think that's really, really important not to get focused too much on vanity metrics, unless you are very keen on like selling, obviously selling, you know, having higher revenue is really, really important, but most people don't have any interest of selling. So like, it's much better to run a business, you know, $500,000 at 80% margin than a million dollars at 10%, you know, like just a lot better to do that. So I think that it would be second. Um, it's like a supposition to just be like, I want to make a million dollars. Like it's just a fake thing. Um, third, advertising. Um, if you can afford it, investing in ads will move you a lot faster. If you can't, uh, sponsorships um, would probably be this, the other thing. Like I would be investing into sponsorships, but if you can afford to invest in a sponsorship, which roughly will range from five to $20,000, depending on the industry, and you're going to do that three or four times a year, I would probably just take all that money and put it into ads instead. Just a huge risk, of course. Like there's a big risk running ads. If you don't know what you're doing, um, you know, it's a very fast way to burn money and Meta will, will happily take your money uh, with no problem. So those are my thoughts. I wish we could keep going, but he got to go save the world, y'all. So with that being said, tell the, there was a lot here. I mean, you talked about the importance of decisions and keeping them in the right perspective, picking the right partner, why it's important to go a mile deep and an inch wide versus a mile wide and an inch deep. You talked a little bit, which I wish we could have got into about client retention and why that's more important. You talked about why it's important to you, but we may have to talk about in the future how you did it at such a high level. Um, just a ton of things. So you guys go back, watch this episode now. Tell the people, because of course, there's a lot of agencies that watch this. If they're like, man, I like this guy. I see he got awards on the wall. He got a book, you know, top level stuff here. How do they reach you? How do they get in contact? What if they want to join? Tell them all of that. This is your time for that. Yeah, prospectingondemand.com, easiest place to find us. You can reach out to me there directly uh, on the uh, website. You can also find me on literally every social platform. If you message me on LinkedIn, I'll probably never answer you because I get a thousand cold pitch DMs a day. But uh, pretty much any other platform, if you message me on, I'll find it and I'll see it. Uh, and I'd be more than happy to chat. All right. Now, and then tell them about the book. What if they want to buy the book? There may be a reader. Antihustlehandbook.com or go on Amazon and search Antihustle. Uh, and yeah, I would love for you to check it out. I put a lot of work and effort into it. Um, it's a great book. Choose your own adventure opportunity uh, to identify right now where hustle is affecting you most in your life and 
giving you exact tools and resources to take action to become less stressed, less anxious, and more confident moving forward. All right, give give a shout out to Wifey, because I know she's going to check this episode out. Can't do it without Shirabella. Without her, none of this business would be possible. Appreciate you. Thank you for everything. I love you. She's such a sweet lady. All right, y'all. I told y'all, season two, we bringing the, the big guns out. This is... This guy's doing it at a high level. He knows what it takes to get there. He's coaching people to get there consistently. He has the resources. He has the team. So some of you have talked to me about, like, what are some good masterminds? What are some good groups? I don't want the boring just let me watch 70 videos that are an hour or hour and a half a piece. I want to be in a good community. I want to learn. I want to be challenged. I want that great experience. I'm telling you right now, this is one of the people to go check out. So. Y'all check this episode out, share it, like it, tag some people on it. If you're like, hey, this is some good, solid stuff right here. Make sure you get it out to the people that need to hear it. But until next time, thank you guys for listening into season two. Take care of yourselves and stay safe. Peace.